Hello, my name is Esteban Serna. I am a senior DynamoDB specialized solution architect. And in these two videos, I'm going to present a series of techniques that you can apply when you design your next application that will use Amazon DynamoDB. It is called DynamoDB Immersion Day NoSQL Design Patterns. And this is the, and this is the first video of the series. Welcome to the DynamoDB Immersion Day, No SQL Designs Patterns. My name is Esteban Serna. I am a senior DynamoDB specialist solution architect, and I help customers optimize their data models. During this Immersion Day, we're going to discuss a few techniques that customers implement in their production workloads. In today's video, we're going to discuss the difference between SQL and NoSQL, the tenets or principles of NoSQL data modeling, and a lot of techniques that we can use for our, our models, for example, artificial sharding and read and write workloads, how to work with complex queries and analytics, what about large items and how to use vertically partitioning, how to query nested JSONs, how to work with relational data model, and at the end, we're going to present a hands-on design challenge that we have available for you. Let's understand the difference between SQL and NoSQL. And first, can you tell me what are you seeing in this picture? If you said hard drives, you are totally right. This picture shows the difference between a state-of-the-art 1970 hard drive, 8 inches hard drive, and how with the pass of the time we have been getting to smaller sizes and more, more performance or more storage capacity. When in 1970s, one state-of-the-art hard drive cost about $140,000 per month to rent. So it was very expensive. If, if we translate that to today's money, it will be almost a million, a million two hundred dollars, two hundred thousand dollars, and uh, it will be very expensive. But you might be thinking, what does this has to do with uh, a NoSQL design discussion? And the explanation is, when SQL was created, storage was very limited. So the assumption was, do not repeat your data. If you're going to create a table about persons, put all the persons in there, another table for country, orders, and all the different entities or dimensions that we're seeing here on the left, because if you need to put them together and create relationships, use an SQL join, which is compute on top of a storage to get your data. With this approach, all the data is stored like a, in a tree structure, uh, and you can uh, experience parent-child relationships uh, with different tables. Now, no SQL databases require a different mindset in comparison with relational data models. No SQL databases on the right side, what we like to do is store the data as aggregate of information. You're seeing that we have the user ID as a partition key, but we have a, a bunch of elements under the sort key, uh, collect together as an aggregation uh, on the user ID. So I could get a lot of data for this user ID, and they are not distributed across different tables. No SQL databases organize the data in the way that you're going to retrieve them. That's how you can achieve higher uh, efficiency. With DynamoDB, the high level entity that you work is a table, which is what I have here in the, in the screen. Inside the table, you will have what we call items. Each one of those items will, will contain attributes and they will have the data types like a string, number or binary. Behind the scenes, DynamoDB will store the information in partitions. All items must have a partition key that will identify them uni uniquely. And you can use a optionally sort key. And together, when you put the partition key and the sort key, they, they form what we call a primary key. The only A1 is required. A2 to A7 are optional. DynamoDB is a schemaless. You don't have to store the same attributes for all of your items. You can choose whatever you want to store in the format that you would like. 
the primary key needs to be a unique identifier for your data so you cannot duplicate your 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 primary key but as in the example that we saw earlier you can have under the same partition key different sort keys and that is how you can get data aggregates when we compare sql versus no sql designs patterns with sql you have different entities living in different tables and when you want to get a relationship between them you run an sql join sql joins is a relatively expensive operation the more joins you add the more the complexity you have as the data from each table needs to be a stage and then asserted to get the information that you're requesting and given the runtime complexity of sql queries and joins uh, the performance of relational database systems is not constant at a scale and what we're going to ask you is to try something different try the no sql approach data normalization reduce the amount of data stored in disk however one of the most constrained resources that impact performance are cpu time and network latency dynamodb is built to minimize both of these constraints by eliminating the need of joins and actually encouraging data denormalization and optimizing the database architecture to fully answer an application query within a single request to an item. These qualities enable DynamoDB to provide single digit millisecond performance at any scale, as the runtime complexity for DynamoDB operations is constant. This is regardless of the data size for common access patterns. Let's focus on the tenets of NoSQL data modeling. The very first one is to define the use case. It is a different mentality, especially if you come from relational data modeling, because you really need to understand all your access patterns up front. With relational data model, you can start creating tables and then you can start adding more tables on the fly because you always have the join to connect the tables together. With NoSQL data model, we approach it in a different way. You need to know the questions that you need to answer and understand the business problem that your application will solve upfront. This is absolutely essential. There are different ways that you can approach this situation. For example, for new applications, you can use the user stories in your sprint to understand what do you need, what data you need to your application needs to support. For existing applications, you can use your query logs to find out what your application is actually getting from the database. And eventually, at some point, you will be able to define if you need to run, for example, some aggregations or if you need to modify a new access pattern and get it in your, in your data model. When you identify the different access patterns, avoid relational design patterns. Remember that I asked you to try something different and and approach table designs in a different way. Do not try to accommodate normalized views into DynamoDB tables because that's considered an anti-pattern. Try to use data denormalization techniques that will allow you to have rich data sets to answer the questions that your application requires. You can start working with one table and accommodating your entities inside this table but you can use as many tables as your application requires. With single table design, you can store different items with the same partition key. This is known as an item collection with different sort keys. This will help you to reduce the number of tables to manage, smooth the traffic to the table, because you're aggregating multiple users' patterns together into the same table. So the, the overall usage tends to be smoother. And you can 
support different queries in a single database call. On the other side, multiple tables, it is a, a pattern that is more traditional from the data, traditional database designs, and it's easier to get your head around the first time you implement it. However, when you use different, when you use multiple tables, you can very easily get into the trap of modeling SQL in NoSQL. If you need to query data across different tables, that means that your application will need to join the data and retrieve that results. That's what we call an application level join, which is also considered an anti-pattern. Your application type is going to be OLTP or it's going to be OLAP type of application. We have 14 different database engines meant to feed the specific workloads. For example, ad hoc queries, data warehouses, data warehousing and OLAP applications may benefit from RDBMS engines. On the other hand, web scale applications including social networks or gaming, media sharing, Internet of Things, they commonly handle tens of hundreds of thousands of requests per second, and they will benefit from Amazon DynamoDB scaling and performance. In terms of data lifecycle, DynamoDB likes to work with hot data, meaning data that you will actually use in your queries to give a very simple example if you have one year's worth of data in your Amazon DynamoDB table, but your queries only ask for the last two weeks of data, you have 50 weeks in your database that you are not using, but you are, going, you are paying the storage for, of, for that data. DynamoDB allows you to set time to leave rules per item that will eliminate that information from your DynamoDB table and then you can use that event to store that information in something like S3 for example. You also have the option to, crea to create on-demand backups for your Amazon DynamoDB tables. You can also enable continuous backups and using point-in-time recovery. At this point you, you should be able to identify your primary key. How your items will be inserted, who are going to be the readers, is going to be a read-heavy application, write-heavy application, is going to be a batch processing, have you identified your entities, and if you have, you should be able to, to overload your items into different partitions. We recommend to use item collections and take advantage of item denormalization as long as it makes sense for your application. Now, this is an iterative process. You should review, repeat, and then review again. It takes some iterations before you can have a, a model that is good for production environments. So don't be discouraged and repeat this process several times. Now we're going to the next section called building queries. We're going to identify how to use or when to use sort key conditions versus filter expressions and understand the composite sort keys in our data model fundamentals. So we do have a word on queries. SQL developers are very familiar with SQL statements that they like the one we have on the left. We have put them here just to make you aware how it will look like. But the reality DynamoDB works with that REST API to perform all data operations. For example, the one that we see in the screen is the query API. Any other API will, will look very similar. The method will be different. We do support PartQL, which is an SQL-like syntax to execute these statements, but the, it is not SQL. Let's, um, let's begin with the obvious, we are use REST API syntax, we don't use SQL. Query always requires an equals expression on the partition key. In other words, you need to know the partition key to execute a query. Partition key is always the part of the data that you know. 
the sort key condition expression uh, allow you to ask questions to your data. You can use the, the, the condition expression begins with or, or between or equals, lower than, greater than, lower than, equal, and greater than, equal. Filter expressions apply after you get the information with your sort key condition. You, you can add additional conditions to filter out your data based on another element that is not your sort key. Queries return all items in a single re response. These queries also support pagination. We're going to give you one megabyte of data at the time. And if your query, let's say it's five giga megabytes of data, then you will need to paginate across five different results. You will get a next token identifier in your query response, and you will need to pass it in the next query that you have. Let's start with this example. We're going to identify the difference between filter expressions and sort key conditions. We have an application where devices are sending updates to a DynamoDB table. We are seeing that we have two devices, sensor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. They are high cardinal. They are nine digit, five digit each. So it looks pretty good. And the table is organized by device ID. Um, and the devices are sending data every five minutes. They are sending the state of the sensor. The sort key is sorted by daytime in format ISO 8601. And we, we could also filter by status. We want to fetch all warning logs for a device that are sorted in the sending order. Order. We have a specific device ID, and we have the example in the top left where the device log is one, two, three, four, five, ordered by date in the same that way, filter on a state equals to warning one. That will be the SQL equivalent query that you will run on a table like this. At the bottom, we have the AWS CLI query expression, where we're doing a query on the table device log, where the key condition expression says that the device ID is equal ID, and at the bottom, we are seeing the device ID. And then we're applying a filter expression where sensor, sorry, where a state is equal to warning one. We are, we are doing the no scan index forward to get the results in a, in a descending order. What will happen with this query? So we notice that we specify the partition key, one, two, three, four, five, the device ID. That means we read all the data that we are seeing in orange in this slide. We filter everything on warning one. So in this case, the fourth record normal will go away. We have three. And we return three of those readings. It doesn't look bad, huh? But now let's think about it. Sensors, they usually report normal readings. They don't, if they report warnings or errors, if something happened. Usually in day-to-day -day, uh, operations and applications, you don't get warnings 95% uh, of the time, right? Usually things are happening okay. And from time to time, you will get some warning. So it is safe to assume that 99% of the readings should be normal. And maybe only one will be warning. With this approach, assuming that we have a thousand reads per day, if 1% are warnings, that means, uh, if 1% are warnings, that means we have uh, one, one we have 10 readings in warning status, but we will need to filter 990 records that are in normal stat to get that response. The problem is not the filter. The problem is that we go and read the entire item collection and then we pay for that value. We've applied the filter after we read the data and at the client side, I will get only my three or 10 records, but you still need to pay for all the data that was read. So we can do better than that. And there is a technique called composite sort key that allow us to use sort key conditions. We're going to take advantage of the sort key conditions. And this time we're going to put together a status plus date 
to retrieve the values that they want using the begins with condition. So always you start with the most generic value on the left, in this case warning, or, well, status, and then you move to the most specific value on the right side. If you're going to add additional columns in the middle, you need to understand that we only support begins with condition. We don't support contains in the sort key condition. So the condition needs to be matched until you, you put the name. In this case, warning one, which is going to give us only three records, are we highlighted here in the, in the diagram. Um, and this query will be more efficient. Why? Because we're using the sort key condition. We're going to the database and only reading three elements. And they are the three elements that we require for our application. If is the case, we can filter on those results. But three is a really reasonable number and it's very efficient at this time. Remember, Queries always need the full equals on the partition key. So you always need to specify the device ID in this scenario. And if you don't specify a sort key condition, you will get the entire item collection. Let's discuss about a new access patterns and how GSIs can help us. Assume that we are supporting the same scenario that we had before. So that access pattern didn't go away. It is exactly the same. But we have a new access pattern. We need to fetch all device logs for a given operator between two dates. So now we're asking questions about the operator. That means the column actually is only Liz and Sue. And we need to get the information based between dates. DynamoDB has this amazing feature called Global Secondary Index that allow us to query our data using a different partition key and sort key from the one that we define in the base table. So if we create a global secondary index where operator is the partition key and date becomes the sort key, we will be able to accommodate the access pattern that we require. GSI's global secondary index allow us to get many to many relationships and we can query both sides of that relationship. The query that it will look like the one that we have at the top side in SQL at the bottom, the reality it is the AWS DynamoDB CLI expression. We specify the table name device log. We also need to specify the index name GSI operator. And we specify the key condition expression. We always try to be as, as detailed as possible. The, the more detailed the expression is, the less capacity units you're going to consume and the more performant it will be, especially in the terms of cost. Now, we want to get all the information from where the operator is least between the 4th of April, the 20th of April, 2020 and the 25th of April, 2020 as well. And you will get these three results that we have in the screen. Now, what about this extreme scenario? There is one special characteristic that I love from GSIs. GSIs, they can add, they can be added and removed at any time. Let's say I want to identify all of the device logs that were escalated to someone. In this case, we have Sarah. And in our list, we only have one record with, that was escalated to Sarah. If I were going to use only the base table, I would have need to, to scan the table and filter based on escalated to to get that result. That will be translated into a very expensive operation. But since GSIs are sparse, I could create a GSI on the fly where the partition key is escalated to the sort key, let's say that is going to be a state hash date. Since we only have one element on this GSI, because all the other attributes, all the other items don't have the attribute escalated to, this GSI will contain only one element. So that's why GSI, GSIs are sparse. Only items that match the GSI primary key are copied into the GSI. This can be used for very efficient indexing of select items. And in this scenario, we can just scan the GSI supervisor because we know that it's only going to contain a few elements. This scenario is really good for this needle in the haystack situations. It is also a cost-effective scan given a, given a certain condition. 
and it works very well for item management. On the takeaways on this section, always build targeted queries using composite keys. Try to be as specific as you can. Start with sort key conditions, and then you supplement with filter expressions. Eventually, if the access pattern is required, use GSIs to address different access patterns. If the, if the access pattern use a different partition key and sort key from the one in the base table, create a GSI to access that information. Let's take a different view of data modeling challenges. Artificial sharding, or also called RAI sharding, highlights the challenges with NoSQL data models and interesting solutions to accessing items. The partition key portion of a table's primary key determines the logical partition in which a table's data is stored. This, in turn, affects the underlying physical partition where this data will be held. A partition key design that doesn't distribute I/O requests effectively can create something that we call internally hot partitions, and that results in throttling and use your provision I/O capacity very inefficiently. The optimal usage of a table's provision throughput depends not only on the workload patterns of individual items, but also on the partition key designs. If you design a very low cardinality partition key or primary key now in this scenario, you will basically will create hot partitions. Each virtual partition supports up to a thousand write capacity units and 3000 read capacity units. Let's go through this example. We have this voting scenario where it's election day. One of the candidate, candidate A, will receive 20,000 votes per second and candidate B will receive 10,000 votes per second. That's, let's say, that's the, what the poll says. We just said that each virtual partition supports up to a thousand writes per second or a thousand write capacity units. For one of the scenarios for candidate A, we're going to have 19,000 throttled events per second and candidate B will be 10, 9,000 throttles per second. This is a really inefficient partition key structure. Please remember whenever you're going to design your partition keys on your tables, high cardinality is what we like. The more virtual partitions, the more throughput you will have in your table. What we can do? So we can write shard the partition key. We can add a, a, the number from zero to, or, or from one to four, or from one to n, before we write. Since you are in control of the writes, so you can put, whenever you do an update item, you put candidate A, hash, plus a random number between zero and n. Since you are in control of the application, the writer, you can define that number n. You can put from 0 to n, from 0 to 4, from 0 to 10. You define that number and you can increment the counters. Now, for this example, we're saying that we created eight partitions at the bottom. In the table, we're only showing four. The idea is that we can distribute the write across different partitions. You define that number of partitions. Let's say that you need to support 100,000 writes per second. How many shards do you need to, to get? So you have the 100,000 items per second. You multiply by the average item size of your, of your data set divided by one kilobyte. Remember one WCU is up to one kilobyte of data. And then you divide by a thousand and that will give you the result of the number of artificial shards. In our example, 100,000 items divided, multiplied by one kilobyte in size divided by a thousand will give us a hundred artificial shards. You might be thinking, okay, but what happens for the reads? For the reading side, since you define that letter N, you know how many different elements you need to retrieve. If N in your scenario was 20, you can issue a batch get item operation to retrieve from candidate A1 to A20, get all the results, and then with a lambda function that could be ex executed every couple of minutes, you can 
update the number, the total number of votes that that candidate had at that specific time. So in this way, whenever the readers are coming, they don't need to calculate all the time how many votes each candidate had on each chart. They just get the total available at this specific time. Lambda function will update the last update time to whatever the update was. There is another technique called right chart at GSI. And that's how you can artificially segment the key space to query an entire table. There is an application that tracks events that people are working on. It inserts item in the base table by event ID, which is randomly generated. However, it needs to alert if an event is older than four hours. The base table has a simple primary key consisting only on its partition key, which is event ID. However, the access pattern requires fetching records older than four hours. In this scenario, there is no way to query across the whole table key space to identify any record that is older than four hours, other than a table scan. Of course, we can table, table scan, but we don't know how many records we're going to have. And if we're going to run that alert every minute, every minute it will be scanning the table, which is not very cost efficiently. To accommodate these access patterns, we will use GSIs, where we use an attribute written by the application with the same random sharding from 0 to n as the GSI partition key and use the sort key timestamp to create a composite primary key. This time, 0 to n is defined by the total throughput of the items that needs to be written into the GSI. The sharding algorithm is on the application side. On DynamoDB, it is an attribute in the right item, which will be used as part of the GSI composite partition key. Since we didn't know anything about the events that were generated, with the random number, if we create something from 0 to 4, 4 shards, for example, or 5 shards, we are putting a known value in our GSI. So that number, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, becomes the the data that we know. So when we have that information, we could do in parallel five different queries for our partition key, where GSI partition key is equals to one, and in the sort key, anything that is greater than four hours ago. This query is very efficient because even if we need to do four or five different queries, depending on the number of the, of the shards that you created, we will only get information in this results if we have something that is greater than four hours ago. Now let's talk about read distribution skew. So far we have addressed low cardinality writes or if there were a write distribution skew, but what happens when we have a lot of reads? It's not always possible to distribute evenly reads and writes, and there are some scenarios that it will be virtually impossible to create enough shards to accommodate to your read. Let's say that we have one very popular item in this example. It's called the instant pod. When we have a product catalog table where we have stored all our different products, the instant pod became popular when we have, let's say, 70,000 requests per second to get information about that instant pod. It will not be easy or optimal to create read charts, especially because the traffic could change. If today we're receiving 70,000 requests per second, tomorrow it could be double of that. To create enough read chart for this situation will add a lot of complexity for the application. How can we accommodate that amount of traffic from our read workload? First, we need to understand the usage pattern. The graph that I have in front of the screen illustrates how many requests per second were made for each item in your table. For collections like a product catalog, some items will be more popular than the others. Do you think there is a way that we can uniformly distribute those reads? Well, you can use a cache. We have Amazon DynamoDB Accelerator, which is a write-through cache, especially created for read-heavy workload. DAX provide increased throughput, a potential operational cost savings by reducing the need of over-provisioning read capacity units. This is especially beneficial for applications that requires repeat reads for individual keys, like the one that we have in our example. 
With DAX, you will get latency in microseconds and you could reduce the cost of over provision a DynamoDB table by just putting the cache in the middle. It is a simplifying caching strategy because DAX supports the same DynamoDB APIs. It is a seamless integration, you just change the endpoint name and now you will be able to speak to the cache and the DynamoDB table. It is a write through cache, so if you send a write operation to DynamoDB Accelerator, DAX will forward that to DynamoDB and write the items to the table. And of course, at the same time, it will write the item into the cache. It is flexible because you can configure DAX for one or many tables, and it's scalable because you can yeah, create up to 10 read replicas for your DAX cluster. It fully integrates with, with Amazon CloudWatch, with Amazon DynamoDB, and you can create a secure VPC for your DAX cluster. This is how you will, it will look like the graph when you implement the cache. So instead of going every single time to a DynamoDB table, you will just get go once or every time that the TTL expires to the DynamoDB table, and the rest of the request will be served by the cache. I hope the content I just presented it is useful for your new application. We've seen techniques that help us to create new applications using Amazon DynamoDB. We have watched different techniques on how to design very efficient queries using sort key condition and then complement using filter conditions if required. We also saw uh, right sharding techniques, grid sharding techniques, and how we can leverage DynamoDB Accelerator for those applications that are read heavy. My name is Esteban Serna, I am a senior DynamoDB Specialized Solution Architect, and thank you for watching.